Hello everyone and welcome to the History of Byzantium, episode 206, What Did Alexius Want? In most accounts of the First Crusade, the Byzantines are presented as somewhat minor players in the unfolding drama, particularly at the start of the story. I expect that you've heard some version of this. Pope Urban was holding a church council at Piacenza in the north of Italy. Envoys arrived from Alexius asking if the pontiff could help recruit some more mercenaries to help fight the Turks. A light bulb appears above Urban's head. He gets a faraway look in his eye and responds, I think we can do a little better than that. Okay, I'm exaggerating slightly, but you get the idea. The Byzantines ask for more mercenaries, and the Pope goes above and beyond, recruiting an entire army, much to Alexius' surprise. Did it really happen like that? That's what we'll be investigating over the next couple of episodes. I can't promise we'll come up with a definitive answer, but we'll certainly reapply the many layers of context that histories of the time stripped away. We start today in Byzantium where we'll discover that the envoys who arrived at Piacenza were not an embassy of last resort. They were part of a seemingly systematic campaign to persuade Western Christians to come to the aid of their Eastern brothers. Let's talk about contacts between East and West, and start with the obvious. The Byzantines have been recruiting Western mercenaries for a long time, particularly in the era after Basil II. The arrival of the Normans in Italy brought a source of excellent soldiers close to the empire's borders, and the Romans quickly discovered that when fighting Pechenegs or Turks, their best troops were these western knights. Their heavy armour and discipline made them the most reliable soldiers when faced with a hail of nomad arrows. Increasingly, the Varangian Guard was staffed by men from western rather than just northern Europe. One source tells us that there was a recruitment office operating in London, promising rich rewards for those who entered imperial service. We also talked at length, as Anatolia collapsed, about the various Norman captains, Hervé, Crepin and Roussel, who came to be vital leaders in the Roman army, commanding units of Latin troops. The soldiers they led came from all over Western Europe, and if they survived, they would return home when their term of duty was over. In order to care for and communicate with these outsiders, the Byzantines always had interpreters and Latin priests operating in and around their barracks. All of this to say that over the past century, the Romans had become accustomed to Westerners and their foibles, while many Latins returned home with tales of Constantinople and its people. Another source of contact between the two sides was pilgrimage to Jerusalem. The last time we talked about journeys to the Holy City was episode 114. Back then, in the 9th century, Venetian ships were the likeliest way for Westerners to make their way east, either via Constantinople and Cyprus, or just heading straight for Alexandria, and then buying a passport from the local governor. By the 11th century, conditions for Christian pilgrims had improved on a number of fronts. The Arab pirates of Sicily and Crete had been swept away, and the conversion of Hungary, Serbia and Bulgaria meant that the overland route across the Balkans was now a popular way to reach the east. Though this would take much longer than a sea voyage, for many a landlubber in the west, the arduous trek across Byzantium was still more preferable than the terrors of the ocean. As Antony Caldellis points out, for many, this made pilgrimage to Jerusalem a largely Byzantine journey. Once a westerner crossed the Danube or Adriatic, he would be on Roman roads for over a thousand miles. The imperial authorities were quite used to issuing papers to smooth pilgrims' travels and giving them advice, guides, and sometimes guards when they exited the empire at Antioch or Laodicea 
and began the final leg across Muslim territory towards Jerusalem. Pilgrimage to the Holy Land was an expensive undertaking, as you can imagine. Therefore, many of those who made the journey were wealthy landowners. Roman emperors were kept informed of who was passing through, and if a visitor was deemed important enough, they might be given imperial hospitality when they came to Constantinople. Through this avenue, we discover that most of the leaders of the First Crusade were actually quite familiar with both Byzantium and Jerusalem. Robert I, the Duke of Normandy, had died on his way back from Jerusalem back in 1035 and was buried at Nicaea. His son, William the Conqueror, kept his father's memory alive and would eventually ask the Byzantines to move his body to Apulia. When the crusade was called, William's son and son-in-law both signed up. Similarly, William of Toulouse had died in Jerusalem on pilgrimage in 1088. When the crusade was called eight years later, his brother, Count Raymond, would be one of its major leaders. Robert I, the Count of Flanders, who we'll talk more about in a moment, had met Alexius in 1089 on his way home from Jerusalem, and sure enough, when the crusade was called, his son took the cross. Obviously, we will talk more about these specific crusade leaders and their motivations in future episodes, but as you can see, pilgrimage to Jerusalem via Constantinople was very much part of life for the nobility of Western Europe. Sometimes when the story of the Crusades are told, it's implied that Constantinople was this exotic, mysterious place. And that was clearly not the case for the leaders of the First Crusade, most of whom were well aware of life in the East, and some of whom had quite personal connections to Alexius himself. Again, the wider point here is that there were plenty of people in the West, clergymen, nobles, and foot soldiers alike, who had either been to Byzantium or who knew all about it from their family networks. As such, news that the Turks were slowly taking over Anatolia and other cities on the road to Jerusalem had begun to spread widely. Presumably, many pilgrims were now forced to sail around Anatolia, and then to put in at Muslim-controlled ports, where they faced a more uncertain reception. Westerners continued to make pilgrimages throughout this period, but each new wave of travellers would have brought news of increasing Turkish domination of places that their parents had known as peaceful Byzantine outposts. These indirect channels of information were then reinforced by the Byzantine government, Across the 1080s and early 1090s, Alexius and his agents were sending out letters to all sorts of people in the West asking for help. Half a dozen Western chroniclers reference Byzantine letters and embassies. Amidst the correspondence, we get the sense that the Romans were trying to pull on the heartstrings of Westerners. The Turks were accused of tearing down churches, of raping men and women alike, of circumcising boys and generally killing good Christians both in Anatolia and the Holy Land itself. While some of this was literally true, warfare being what it is, the sentiment was a blatant exaggeration, completely at odds with the friendly diplomatic relations that we've seen between Alexius and the Turks. The twinning of the fates of Constantinople and Jerusalem was also clearly a Byzantine tactic. Alexius knew how important Jerusalem was to Western Europeans, and various pieces of correspondence make appeals for aid, first and foremost on the basis of the damage being done to the Holy Sepulchre and the Eastern churches. The best way to aid them, clearly, was to enlist with the Roman army. The emperor also dipped into Constantinople's considerable relic collection. We find all sorts of items, including pieces of the true cross, being shown to or given to pilgrims on their journey home. This included fairly obscure clergymen who wrote about the emperor's generosity. Several scholars believe Alexius was trying to stimulate a thirst for such items in Western circles. Those who returned home with precious relics 
would install them in their local churches with much ceremony, and doubtless they spoke about their experiences and told tales of Turkish disruption to the traditional route east. I don't need to tell you why the Byzantines were sending these messages out. As we discussed at the time, the Romans were desperately short of experienced troops in their wars with the Normans and Pechenex. To even contemplate a reconquest of Anatolia was going to need a massive increase in recruitment. It seems likely that Alexius was no longer looking for the trickle of individuals and small groups of Western knights, the kind who regularly turned up on the Bosphorus looking for work. Instead, he wanted entire companies, hundreds of men who were used to fighting together, to come and serve the Eastern Empire. This was a hard sell. The reason this didn't happen very often is obvious. That type of unit in the West would only exist in the retinues of very wealthy landowners. Landowners who obviously needed their retainers at home, ready to defend their land. Hence the propaganda campaign that the Byzantines seem to have been running. Only by linking the fate of Anatolia to that of Jerusalem did the Romans believe they could convince entire units of Westerners to come and fight for them. The reason we're so confident that this is what Alexius was after is that he'd already managed it once. We now return to Robert I, the Count of Flanders, who I left out of the regular narrative in order to keep us on track. As you hopefully remember, back in 1089, Alexius took his army all the way to Dristra on the Danube in order to snuff out the Pechenegs once and for all. It was a mistake. In the battle that followed, the Pechenegs routed the Romans, and Alexius was stabbed in the behind as he fled. It was in this dishevelled state that Alexius was to meet Robert. Flanders is in Belgium, in case you didn't know. So, the Count of Flanders was on his way home from pilgrimage when he stopped off at Constantinople. He was persuaded to visit Alexius' army camp in Thrace for a personal audience. Robert would have been well aware of the Turkish presence in Anatolia and the Levant, and now he came before an emperor at a very low ebb. Moved by this personal attention and the empire's plight, the count pledged to send the emperor 500 knights when he returned home. And he did. The 500 experienced cavalrymen were just what Alexius needed. He dispatched them along with a bevy of other Western recruits to Nicomedia, which was under threat from the Sultan at neighbouring Nicaea. Eventually, the Byzantines were able to retake the city and push the Turks back to Nicaea. Major investment was then poured into the area. The Romans constructed a fort on the coast called Kibitos to help shield and supply Nicomedia, and Latin clergy were installed inside. Clearly, Alexius had plans to recruit more Western knights to operate in this area, and to eventually, hopefully, retake Nicaea. After the success of this campaign, Alexius was keen to make contact with as much of the Western nobility as he could. Perhaps he could persuade them to help him retake the entire pilgrimage route, one walled city at a time. Still, Nicaea was a formidable fortress. It would take more than 500 or even 5,000 men to intimidate its defenders. Rather than appealing to individual Western lords, it would be handy to have one recruiting sergeant with the clout necessary to gather a large force on his own. In fact, involving the papacy in attempts to defend Byzantium had been imperial policy throughout the 11th century, as you know. Back in episode 188, The Great Schism, we talked about Rome and Constantinople trying to team up to take down the Normans. The Northmen were brutal and relentless in seizing forts and castles across Italy and disregarding both the concerns of the papacy and the authority of Byzantium. The Battle of Civitate, which followed, saw the Pope himself recruiting and leading troops, unsuccessfully as it turned out. 
but the idea of the Western Church gathering an army to achieve its goals was not forgotten. According to one papal source, Byzantine envoys mooted the idea of the Pope recruiting knights to free Jerusalem as early as 1062, about a decade before Mans occurred. In the aftermath of Romanos Theogenes' defeat, the idea was resurrected. This time, the Pope in question, Gregory VII, responded enthusiastically. He dashed off letters to a number of Western nobles, canvassing their support for a campaign to Jerusalem, that Gregory himself would command. I did mention this back in episode 195. Gregory's entreaties hit several stumbling blocks, including the fact that he was locked in conflict with the German emperor at the time. But as you can tell, this was a very significant episode. The crusade in embryonic form was created here, just three years after Mans occurred. We will of course talk all about Gregory and the papacy side of this in a future episode. For now though, I think we have enough evidence to bring our discussion to a close. Clearly, the traditional story that Alexius was asking for more recruits and the Pope shocked him by gathering an entire army is misleading. Instead, we find that not only was Alexius actively seeking large units to come east, but that he was well aware that regular army pay would not be enough of an inducement. The Byzantines had long been couching their recruitment in terms of a struggle to free Jerusalem from the domination of Muslim powers. They were stirring up discontent amongst the Western nobility over the disruption to the traditional pilgrim route. The Byzantines were also clearly aware that the ideal recruitment office was the Lateran Palace. If the papacy could be persuaded to gather an army to fight in Anatolia, then Byzantine goals would be far easier to achieve. Does all of this mean that Alexius is the real architect of the crusade, rather than Pope Urban? No, I don't think so. As we will discuss in future episodes, the Pope pitched the campaign specifically to appeal to Western knights in a way that the Vasilevs could never have done. But it seems very clear that the Byzantines were heavily involved in shaping the forthcoming campaign, far more involved and integral to the form it took than popular histories of the Crusades tend to acknowledge. It was the Byzantine desire to link the loss of Anatolia with pilgrimage to Jerusalem that ultimately created the conditions for the First Crusade. Alexius probably was surprised by the size of army that Urban was able to gather, but he can't have been too displeased. Next time, let's flip the coin and look at things from Pope Urban's point of view. Why did he and his predecessors respond favourably to these Byzantine calls for help? What was in it for them? Ultimately, we must ask the question, what did Urban want? There's no way to smoothly transition from the most medieval of concerns to the most modern. The history of Byzantium is now on Instagram. <laughs>